All right, I'm picking up the second half of chapter seven. Starts on page 137 and ends on 145. Cheryl, wake up. What the heck is wrong with you? Wes took the face of his third and fourth children's mother in his hands and began to shake her. She lay on the couch, saliva dripping out of the corners of her mouth onto her red Gap t-shirt. Her pupils dilated and rolling to the back of her head, heroin still flowing through her veins. Wes ran to the kitchen and rushed back to her with a glass of water, splashing some on her face and pouring some down her throat until she came to. This was not the first time she had gotten high like this, but it was the first time Wes had seen it. Wes had met Cheryl years before, while he was still living in Dundee Village. She lived down the street from Alicia in a two-bedroom house with her son. She was older than Wes, already 23 when they met, but a relationship developed. His two children with Alicia came back to back, born in 1992 and 1993. His children with Cheryl came in the same fashion, born in 1995 and 1996. Where did you get this from? Wes asked, but Cheryl just kept repeating the same response as if they were the only words she knew. I'm sorry. Wes cursed himself. He knew he had been turning a blind eye to telltale, telltale signs that things were moving in this direction. Just a month ago, he noticed he was missing money and lectured Cheryl. Stop bringing your friends into my house if they're going to be stealing my stuff. She'd agree, and the conversation had ended, but the problem was not solved. Before that, he confronted her after finding a pipe in her closet. Wes, do you think I will be using while I'm pregnant? She'd ask. He let the matter drop. His love for her and their kids kept him from seeing the truth that now stared him in the face. Cheryl was an addict. The sight of her coming off her high, stumbling to the bathroom, disgusted Wes. He saw this every day. The people who would line up around the corner for drugs. The people who would do anything to score. He knew these people because he was the one who got them what they needed. It was his job. And it pained him to realize that the mother of his children was just like them. Wes grabbed his keys and walked out the door. He wasn't sure where he was going, but he knew he couldn't stay there. Wes was tired. Tired of being locked up. Tired of watching drugs destroy entire families, entire communities, and entire city. He was tired of being shot at and having to attend the funerals of his friends. He understood that his thoughts contradicted his actions. He had long since accepted that. It was just that his tolerance of his own hypocrisy was wearing thin. He walked down the broken blocks past clusters of abandoned buildings, the glass from shattered windows on the sidewalk, junkies on the steps. He walked for miles through a steady drizzle, trying to clear his mind while 13-year-olds ran drugs up and down the streets. Wes turned down Emerson Avenue, walking to where his friend Levi's house. Levi was a bit younger than Wes, but had managed to get out of the hustling game a few months back. At first, Wes had been confused by Levi's decision. Why would he give up so much money to go straight? But days like today were making Wes think that maybe Levi was the smart one. The rain began to subside as Wes approached Levi's house. He walked up the stairs and rang the doorbell. When Levi saw Wes, his face lit up. Wes, what's good, Joe? Levi said with his distinctive Baltimore drawl. A trace of a southern twang with words contracted and vowels swallowed. Come in, come in. Wes sat on the couch in the middle of the room. His shoulders slumped, his eyes downward. I'm done, man, he said. I want to get out, do something different with my life. But I'm not sure what. I'm not going back to high school. I'm too old for that. But I'm tired of running these streets. Levi went to the kitchen for a couple of sodas and sat on the couch next to Wes. Listen, there are definitely some options, but I'm telling you, it won't be easy. It will take work, and it will take commitment. Even when the days are tough, you have to. You have got to push through. Feel me? Yeah, man, I'm ready to try something, anything. Levi told Wes about Job Corps, a program he was about to enter. Started in 1964 as a federal initiative, Job Corps was designed to help disadvantaged youth. It was part of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society and was modeled after the, the Depression-era Civilian Cons Conservation Corps. Levi was hoping to become its newest recruit. Levi would be entering the Job Corps as a high school dropout, but was hoping to leave with a General Equivalency, equivalency Diploma, a GED, and the skills to help him land a job at a hot water boiler repairman, as a hot water boiler repairman. He knew the pay would be lower than what he was making on the streets, but the work was steady and honest, and he would have more time to give his family without injury, death, or incarceration looming. West told him he would think about it. 
Levi found a piece of paper and wrote down a date and an address. This is where to go if you are serious about the job corps. It doesn't take much. Just come through. They'll handle all the rest. Wes had heard about the job corps before. His Aunt Virginia had started job corps but didn't finish. She said it was too much like jail. What Levi was talking about seemed different, but Wes wasn't sure which version to believe. As he walked away from Levi's house, Wes pondered other reasons to be doubtful about job corps. He had two babies' mothers, four kids, and his own mother to take care of. Wes stepped along beneath street lights and a quarter moon. The day was coming to an end, but he knew it would be a long night. Wes looked down at his forearm at the newest addition to the gallery of images inked on his body. A few weeks back, Wes and three of his friends had gone to a tattoo parlor in Baltimore and all gotten the same design permanently inked on their bodies. A black devil's head with horns and sinister eyes. His skin had almost healed, but the pain behind the tattoo was as fresh as ever. When the three had arrived at the shop, they searched for a symbol that best represented their allegiance to one another and their shared situations. When he was growing up, Wes would occasionally follow his mother to the new Metropolitan Church on Sunday, but even on his sporadic visits, he never felt any connection. He would watch the singing and dancing, cheering and crying, and chalk it all up to theatrics. Wes would wonder if anyone there even knew who or what they were praying to. Where was God when people didn't make enough money to feed their families? Where was God when kids were selling rocks at 12 years old and their parents encouraged it because the kids were the main breadwinners in the home? Where was God when a young boy came home from a school that was as uninterested in him as he was in it? Where was God when a kid had a question and looked to his friends in the streets for an answer because his father was locked up and his mother strung out? Wes remembered leaning back in the black padded parlor chair and taking a puff on his blunt as the tattoo artist sealed the ink into his skin. F God, he said, drawing in a lung full of smoke. If he does exist, he sure doesn't spend any time in West Baltimore. After agonizing over it, Wes decided to go with Levi to his final job court interview. While there, Wes sat down with a counselor and began a conversation. Do you have a high school degree? No, Wes replied. Do you have a record? Yes. Are you interested in and serious about this program? After receiving the same deployment date as Levi, Wes understood that the only question he was asked that mattered was the last one. When the time came, he packed his bags and said goodbye to his family. Where he was going, he had to go on his own. Two weeks after his conversation with Levi, Wes stood in a parking lot on the corner of Saratoga and Green Streets, waiting for the bus that would take him to the Woodland Job Corps Center in Laurel. The Sunday evening air seemed unusually still as the baby blue bus, school bus rolled. The bus was packed with a motley group of men and women who represented the spectrum of ages, neighborhoods, backstories, and motivations. But they were united and looking for a new chance. They believed the secret to their second lives hid on the sleepy Howard County, Maryland campus of Job, of job Corps. Most everyone on the bus slept during the 30-minute ride. But Wes sat up, staring out the window, wondering about the next few months. He'd been assured during his interview that he would be allowed to return home every weekend if he chose to and could make a few calls during the week. He was assured he would be able to bring his music and have time to work on his lyrics. He was told that if he was willing to put in the work, he would leave the program a different person. The bus finally entered the Job Corps campus. The dark night appeared even darker as they pushed down a long asphalt road. A tree canopy, canopy seemed to collapse over the bus as they slowed to a creek. Wes noticed goalposts to his right, hand, right, and assuming they indicated a football field, he smiled. The bus stopped at the Welcome Center and unloaded. The passengers formed a line, awaiting room assignments. When Wes got to the front of the line, an attractive woman in her mid-thirties stood before him with a clipboard and a smile. Welcome to Laurel. What's your last name? She said. Wes told her his name, and she gave him his room assignment. He stood there smiling at the girl until she nodded at him, as if to say, okay, you got your room, now move on. Wes got the hint, grabbed his bags, and carried them along the concrete walkways, curving through manicured lawns that led to his dorm. As he walked, his eyes took in the campus. He noticed a beach volleyball court complete with sand, a full basketball court with regulation lines and nets for the rims set next to a beautiful wooden gazebo. This was exactly what Wes imagined a college... Uh, Imagine a college campus would look like. He had never seen anything like it before. When Wes arrived in his room, he found Levi lying back on the bed, his feet crossed and hands behind his head with his fingers interlocked, smiling. Wes smiled back at him. 
Relieved to see a living piece of home so far away. The spacious room was far from the prison-like image his Aunt Virginia had painted for him. So far, so good, Wes said as he dropped his bags and lay on his bed, imitating Levi's leisurely pose. In the first phase of Job Corps, students are tested to place them at the right level of GED training. One day, after they took the test, the results came back. Levi needed to go through the full month-long pre-GED training. Wes, by contrast, finished near the top of his class. He completed the coursework and received his GED a month later. He was already reading at the level of a sophomore in college. His quick success had Wes thinking differently about his life. He proudly displayed his new diploma at home excitedly mounting it one week in a frame one weekend in a frame he bought the week he received his test scores the bus would bring him back to baltimore city every friday evening but much of his weekend was spent preparing for the next week in laurel many of the other students were now looking to west for help with their ged prep for assistance with their personal issues and for friendship just as he had on the corners of baltimore west became a leader after completing his academic coursework west started on his professional training he selected carpentry as his vocational specialty. He had always been handy. Years ago, the siding had begun to fall off his mother's house. His brother Tony held the siding level as Wes's steady hand nailed the replacement into place. The crack of the hammer as it connected with the head of the nail. The way the body of the nail disappeared into the siding. The joy of admiring a finished product. The quiet thrill of a job well done. He enjoyed building, was but was now motivated to learn true skills. After the mandatory training sessions on the use of the equipment and safety precautions, the teacher told the class he wanted them to create something on their own. The teacher made Wes laugh. He was thin and balding and full of jokes. But Wes appreciated his skill and his commitment to this group, group of young men about whom nobody else seemed to care. As Wes thought about what he wanted to make, the image of his five-year-old daughter came to him. For much of her life, Wes had been gone. Whether at the job corps or behind bars, he had missed many of the milestones in her growing up. The situation at home had become even more ten tenuous. Cheryl's drug problem had become more consuming and overt. The kids were now basically living with Wes's mom. Cheryl complained but never, really, but never made a real effort to take the kids back. She knew what everyone around her knew. She was in no position to take care of her own children. Wes had to reconsider what it meant to be a father. He wanted to protect his young daughter, chef for her. One by one, the students declared what they were going to make. The list of objects blurred together, small pieces of furniture and little decorative items until it was Wes's turn. He had tuned out the conversations around him to become lost in thoughts about his family. The teacher repeated the question to Wes. All Wes could think about was his daughter. Without a thought about what he was taking on, he announced that he wanted to build her a house. The teacher raised his eyebrow and said, interesting, a small house? Wes looked back at the teacher, but in his mind, he was looking at the house he wanted to build. No, a house big enough for her to get in, a house to protect her. The other people in the room looked at one another and giggled, but Wes did not flinch. His, father, his teacher smiled. Great, I look forward to seeing it. He spent the next seven months building his daughter's house from scratch. He sandpapered every board, hammered every nail, leveled every edge. When it was finished, the house stood five feet high and an arm's length across. It included shutters, a door, and windows. It was by far the most complex project in the group. When it was finished, it sat in the display room along with the projects of his classmates, including wooden plaques and a plain box that someone called a telephone base. To Wes, the house was more than just a project to complete. It was a daily reminder of why he was there. These past months had been the most important and enjoyable in Wes's life. He learned skills, gained confidence, and finally felt his life could go in a different direction. He stayed at the Job Corps Center so he could provide a better life for his kids. He stayed for his mother, who sat home watching Tony continue moving in and out of the criminal justice system. He stayed at the Job Corps Center for himself. After seven months, Wes met his graduation from Job Corps with as much trepidation as excitement. No longer would he have to show up at the large parking lot on Sunday evenings waiting for the blue bus. No longer would he have to share a room with Levi, who, after a troubled start, was completing his GED requirements and starting his vacational classes. Wes would now be on his own. Wes's first job was as a landscaper at a home in Baltimore County. It was a temporary gig, and after five months, he moved on to rehabbing homes in the city. Another temporary job. After that, 
He worked as a food preparer at a mall in Baltimore. A year after completing the job corps training, West realized the only consistency in his employment was inconsistency. That and the fact that none of these jobs paid over $9 an hour. One day after completing his shift chopping vegetables, West took a detour on the way home. He went by his old West Baltimore neighborhood to pick up a package. He had stayed away from these blocks because he had been so busy since getting back from Laurel. He worked 10 hours a day and came home with barely enough energy to play with his kids and barely enough money to feed and clothe them. But the main reason he avoided these streets was that he felt that they held nothing for him. He had changed. At least he wanted to believe that, and he continued to tell himself that as he walked through the blocks. He raised his head and acknowledged the many faces he had not seen for over a year. Wes was amazed as, as he watched how little the game had changed. The corner boys still pulling lookout, the muscles still looking as intimidating as ever. Wes watched as across the street, a young man no older than 16 pulled out a wad of cash held together by a rubber band and began showing it off to a friend. Lines of heads circled the block looking for their next hit. Some of the players had changed, but the positions were the same. West finally got home and went immediately to his kitchen. He was living on his own now in a small apartment. He placed the package he picked up on the table, sat down, and put his head on his, in his hands. The pressure was breaking West down. Alicia complained that he was not giving her enough money to provide for the kids they shared. Cheryl was now constantly calling him about wanting more time with the kids, which meant she wanted more money to take care of them. His mother needed more money because she was raising both Wes's and Tony's kids. Wes banged his fist against the top of his head as his elbows rested on the kitchen table. While at the job course center, Wes had felt his problems floating off in the soft country air of Laurel. A year after graduating, he realized they had not disappeared. They simply returned to Baltimore, waiting for him to come back. In his absence, they compounded. Tears welled in Wes's eyes but never fell. He'd realized long ago that crying does no good. He quickly rose and went to the sink to fill a pot with water. He ignited the flame on the front burner of his stove. While the water was heating, Wes walked to the front of his apartment and turned on 92Q, a popular Baltimore radio station. The last few bars of a Jay-Z song filled the room. When the streets is watching, blocks keep clocking, waiting for you to break, make your first mistake. Wes returned to the kitchen. He reached in the refrigerator and pulled out the baking soda. Muscle memory kicked in as he tapped the side of the box and poured three ounces of the baking soda into the black pot, watching the powder swirl and fall to the bottom. He placed the baking soda back in the refrigerator. Taking a deep breath before, pe before picking up the package, he took a bound plastic bag out of the brown paper wrapping. He squeezed the package, testing its density. He reached over to the drawer that held his cutlery and pulled out a knife, brought the blade to the corner of the plastic bag. As the baking soda swirled in the rapidly heating pot, Wes held the plastic bag with both hands and poured in nine ounces of cocaine. Mm.